this slideshow looks at levers um, and when we think about levers we can see them um, outside of sport when you use a wheelbarrow and a seesaw um, and a can opener all those kinds of things um, even where we place a door handle on a door to maximize leverage in sport it's easiest to see perhaps with implements like a cricket bat or an ice hockey stick but don't forget that your arms and legs are also levers that you um, manipulate their their length so as to get an advantage um, and that's the mechanical advantage that levers give us, which we'll talk about shortly. Not much to the key knowledge for this week, just the three components of levers, which are a force, an axis and a resistance. So they're the three components that all levers have. And just to try to unpack what it means by the mechanical advantage that these levers offer us in sport. So a refined question for what's going to be 30 slides worth of information. Um, how can we apply the principle of leverage to improve sporting performance? So what can we each do to maximise the principles of leverage? While the guiding questions look quite simple, they do require quite a bit of work to get your head around the components of levers and to distinguish between the three different classes and I guess examples that we use in the everyday world and examples that we use in sport. The textbooks define levers as rigid bars i'm not sure if that really helps you but um they have three fundamental components an axis or a pivot point uh, a place where force is applied and then also a resistance to overcome and depending on how these levers are structured um, a lever can help us to generate greater force or help us to generate greater speed so as previously said certainly striking implements should come to mind when we're talking about levers and so we think about a long baseball bat or cricket bat or tennis racket but also just think about how you place your arms and legs when you run and throw and swim and cycle to generate um, either greater force or greater speed. So the three components that are fundamental to all levers are an axis, a resistance and a force. Now the study design uses those three terms, but there are other names that might be um, used in questions for each of those. So an axis might also be called a fulcrum or a pivot point. A resistance might um, use the word load and a force might um, use the term effort. So they are the three components all levers have. It's just a matter of how they are arranged that determines what class of lever uh, we're talking about. So first class levers have the axis in the middle. It doesn't matter which side of the axis the force and the resistance are, that's irrelevant. But if the axis is in the middle of those three components, then we are talking about a first class lever. So there's some pictures there. I wonder if before I hit the next slide, you can think about where the axis, the resistance and the force go in these two images. So one for a household implement, the scissors, and another for rowing. Now if we take the sporting example of rowing first, the force is coming from the rower's hands. The axis is that little pivot point on the sort of outrigger of his um, canoe or boat, whatever you want to call it. And then the resistance is obviously when the water um, strikes the paddle or the oar. So as the axis is in the middle, it's a first class lever. Equally, if you look at something like scissors, the force comes from the fingers in the little finger holes. The axis is where the two blades cross over and the resistance is the paper or the cardboard that you're cutting. So in both cases, the axis is in the middle. So it's considered a first class lever. Here's a diagram from one of the other textbooks just to show you where these um, levers exist. So the only example we see in the body in all the textbooks of a first class lever is this one with we look at our neck so if you think about the posterior neck muscles have to do something to keep your chin up off your chest um, that means that the axis is in the middle of resistance and force the seesaw is a classic um, non-anatomical lever um, and the axis is smack bang in the middle of those two people bouncing up and down on the seesaw so as long as the axis is in the middle you've got a first class lever in the case of second class levers, this time resistance is in the middle of the three components. So axis and force can be either side. As, as long as resistance is in the middle, we've got a second class lever. Uh, the two examples you've got there are a, real, a wheelbarrow and a bottle opener. Now the bottle opener is an interesting one, depending on how you use it to open the bottle um, in determining where the axis is. So have a go before I hit the next slide. Can you identify the axis, the resistance and the force on those two images? Looking at the wheelbarrow first, you can see where you place your hands at the end of the handles would be where the force is applied. The resistance comes in the weight or the load in the tray in the middle of the lever. And then the axis is the wheel that allows you to push around your soil in this case. So resistance is in the middle of those three components, making it a second class lever. 
The bottle opener I've got here is the axis being the top point of the bottle opener, the resistance being where the cap would go in, I suppose, the socket of the bottle opener, and then the force is where your hand is on the end of that. Now, depending on how you use a bottle opener, you might be able to manipulate your axis and your resistance. So next time you are opening some bottles, have a bit of a think about that. The only second class lever that I've been able to find within the body that would constitute an anatomical lever um, is this case here of when you're standing on your tippy toes. So the axis is the, the balls of your feet or the top of your toes, if you like. The resistance is your whole body weight that's pushing down um, against gravity. And then the force that's being applied with your calves um, attached to the back of your foot. Uh, the wheelbarrow there is drawn as a different diagram to the previous. And in both cases, we have the resistance in the middle. And we're always looking for what's in the middle so that we can determine which class of lever it is. So that's a second class lever. Then finally, we come to the third class lever. And if we've already had axis in the middle for first class and resistance in the middle for second class, that only leaves us with force. So if force is in the middle of your lever, you have got a third class lever. Uh, these are the most prevalent within the body. So the ones we'll spend more time looking at in prac classes and presumably more uh, questions coming for these in terms of your exam at the end of the year. So see if you can identify the axis, the resistance and the force for the bicep curl. Um, and also kicking a ball. Now, if you just take your right ear and gently twist your head to the right, dropping your right ear onto your right shoulder, it'll help you read the biceps curl diagram um, more easily. So the axis is on the outside of that lever or the edge of that lever, it's the elbow joint. The force is being applied by the biceps, but only because it attaches over the elbow joint with a tendon. So the force is actually being applied in the middle of the lever from the biceps tendon, which is placed at the lower part of the forearm, leaving us with the uh, dumbbell as a resistance. So by just twisting your head to the right, hopefully you can see it's axis elbow, force is in the lower forearm, and then resistance is on the dumbbell. If we do the opposite for the kicking, and just tilt your head left ear to left shoulder, axis is the knee joint, the quadriceps are working here um, in, in extending the leg and the quadriceps again attach over the patella um, or over the knee joint, sorry, um, to the tendon below the knee joint. So that the force is being applied, if you like, at the top of the shin and the resistance is the football. So again, axis is on the outside of the lever, force is in the middle and resistance the other end. So both are perfect examples of third class levers, the most prevalent in the body, but you might just need to orient your head to make sense of where the force is being applied. And here's a different diagram uh, from the Jacaranda text just to show you the same um, image in the same movement I was talking about previously. So the biceps curl, the axis is clearly the elbow. You can just make out the, um, the tendon from the biceps that's attached to the lower forearm. That's generating the force to overcome the resistance, which is the dumbbell. So as force is in the middle of that lever, it's a third class lever. I suppose a different sporting example would be the fishing um, with the axis being the, the point of the rod, if that's being tucked into your hip, I suppose, the force is your hands or arms and the giant fish at the end is the resistance. So again, force is in the middle. We've got a third class lever. And just another image or picture here to show you the classic bicep curl and we've got the forearm flexing because um, force is in the middle. It's a third class lever. When you look at the runner, uh, we've got again an axis point this time from the heel. Um, the force is coming from the quadriceps, again, over the knee joint, and then the resistance is at the end of the lever, which is the body weight. In contrast to that, another lower leg, but from a different axis point, we're looking at the knee, uh, which is providing the axis. The force, again, is the quadriceps spanning over the knee joint, um, attaching by a tendon, and the resistance is the football, the Aussie rules football. So similar to the soccer, um, just a different diagram. So as I previously said, if you can remember this little acronym, ARF, and if you want to make it sound like a dog bark, ARF, ARF, go for it. Um, all we're looking for in levers to identify the lever is what is in the middle. Um, the arrangement of the things on the outside is irrelevant. They can chop and change, but whatever's in the middle will indicate first class axis, second class resistance, third class force. So the principle of leverage, and it helps us to understand the mechanical advantage which is a fancy way of saying what does it actually do for us, um, is built around common sense and logic. So it can be expressed either way that the velocity is greater at the end of a long lever than at the end of a short lever, or 
that the further a point of a lever is from the axis, the greater its velocity. So what does that mean? Let's have a look. So if we look at the baseball example, uh, this diagram here shows you that the velocity at the end of the bat is much greater than at the middle of the bat. It's traveled a much uh, further distance in the same time so that that um, longer lever generates a greater velocity than a shorter lever. It might be easier if you like to think about S1 just being a shorter bat and that S2 is a longer bat so that you can see that the longer lever, the longer bat will give you greater velocity or um, club bat stick speed um, for a lot of things being equal. And that's the mechanical advantage levers give us that we can generate greater velocity by having a fully extended lever. It's not just sticks and rackets and bats so that we can think of. Uh, when you're kicking a football or a soccer ball, as in this case here, if we're going for distance, then it makes sense for us to have our leg fully extended. Uh, we can also talk about overcoming moment of inertia as well by starting with a bent, bent knee, um, but then making sure that upon impact, our leg is fully extended if we want to generate greatest um, angular velocity, if you like, at the end of the foot to generate greatest distance from the ball, which also brings in projectile motion. Of course, there's a formula to help explain what I've been talking about for the last few slides. Um, and that is how we can quantify the mechanical advantage of the lever to determine whether it's actually a lever that's going to help us generate greater force or a lever that's going to help us generate greater speed. In the case of extending our leg for a kick of a soccer ball and also uh, choosing a longer bat rather than a shorter bat for baseball, they both serve to increase the resistance arm. So their mechanical advantage is actually for speed because we're deliberately manipulating the lever uh, to make it as long as we can so that the resistance is furthest or further away from the axis. Uh, that's one way of looking at um, this idea of mechanical advantage and not being too caught up by the formula. Bringing it back to basics now, uh, increasing force. If we want to generate greater force, then we deliberately increase the force arm. So if you were choking down on that crowbar, you'd have a very difficult time prying off that uh, wooden floorboard. So if we can uh, elongate or extend the force arm, the distance that the force is being applied from the axis, the purpose of that lever is to generate greater force. Conversely, in the one that we've spoken about previously, before we got all caught up in mechanical advantage, is where we deliberately increase the resistance arm. Uh, this won't have a mechanical advantage, but what it will do is let us get a massive range of motion I was thinking about the angular motion, but also help us to generate much greater speed by deliberately increasing the distance um, of the resistance from the axis. So if you had longer oars um, in the rowing example there, you would obviously be generating greater range of motion and greater speed. Equally, a taller tennis player with a longer arm and a longer tennis racket hitting at the point, or the top point of the racket, uh, deliberately increases the resistance arm to give the advantage of increasing speed at the racket head. This diagram was from the Jacaranda text, and I just put it in to show you that they've actually got the axis here as the hip. It could quite easily be the shoulder, depending on who is performing the skill and how much body turn or rotation they're, they're putting in. It could also be the elbow, depending on if it was particularly a novice kind of tennis player with not much backswing. Um, but again, we've got the force in the middle, so it's a third class lever. Just looking at some more um, increased resistance arm shots here to get that advantage of range of motion and increased velocity or racket head speed. There's a very early shot of Roger Federer with his arm fully extended. Also, the racket looks like it's just about to make contact and hopefully will be fully extended, such that all things being equal, there's greater velocity at the end of a longer lever. And just two more images just showing you that, assuming they always talk about the long arm or the long reach, um, to maximize the resistance arm so that we can get greater range of motion and greater speed um, and give us that biomechanical advantage. Just the same as Usain Bolt taking off there, he's pushing off from a leg that's fully outstretched so we can generate greater velocity on it. He'll bend his knee to overcome the moment of inertia of the leg um, and to initiate movement, but then when he strikes the ground, he wanna have his leg fully extended. <laughs> 